So, all right, good evening, everyone. Let me just pull up my slides here and we'll get started. So, we're going to talk about weight loss surgery. Uh, we're going to talk about what we have available to our patients right now, what those surgeries are. And then you may have been hearing a little bit about these extra procedures that we're also offering that are out there. So we're gonna talk about them um, and leave a little bit of room for discussion at the end if you have any questions for sure. So a little bit about me. Um, I was here at Christiana Care actually as a, even a medical student, fell in love with this community. And so I came here for my residency for five years, absolutely loved it went up to Stony Brook University where I met one of the most important female surgeons of my life who's now my uh, amazing mentor. But I trained in foregut surgery, uh, advanced foregut uh, surgery, and bariatric surgery. So I do everything through very small incisions. I absolutely do not like large incisions. I keep, I'll leave that to the Dr. Gillespie here and, and the other surgeons. But I like to operate through incisions that are about the width of my pinky. Um, that's, that's, that's the max for my patients for the most part. Um, and I think it has a lot of technical finesse to it, so I think I'm well suited as a female in this uh, profession. So, um, but it's, it's really an amazing, amazing job. And I tell my residents all the time that I, I have the best job in the whole world, and I truly believe everyone should feel that way about their job because I get to do some pretty great stuff to, to help patients out. So I came back to Christiana Care, and I've been in this role for the last nine months and hope to be here for a very long, long time. I'm building their bariatric surgical services right here at Christiana, um, really up at Wilmington, actually, and also building their reflux center for them, which hopefully the community will start to find out more about over the next year as we really build that. Um, so again, I do bariatrics, I do a lot of reflux surgery, and even some general surgery, gallbladders, hernias, things like that. And that's my team to the left there. We picked that day to take a picture because it was an all-female crew, the anesthesiologist, the CRNA, the nurses and scrub techs in the room, my, my residents there too um, were all females that day, so it's always kind of a fun thing uh, to have, have a, lot of, a lot of females in the room. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about morbid obesity and obesity and what exactly that is, because we hear those terms tossed around all the time. Um, what does that actually mean? What does that, how does it impact our health, right? Because it, if it's just an obesity thing, a cosmetic thing, no, it's really a health issue that we're talking about. It's a disease process. We're gonna talk about surgical procedures that are out there um, and available to our patients, what we need to take care of those patients long term, and then we'll be talking to Dr. Gillespie, who's gonna give us, he's gonna really give the fun pictures I'm gonna give the background in front of those pictures, so. All right, so let's get down to it. What is obesity, right? I mean, right, we talk about obesity and, you know, the, we just had the presence physical a couple months ago and he wanted to make sure that number was a certain number, right? He wanted to make sure he's out of the range, right? We talk about obesity, what really is it? So it's easy, it's an excessive accumulation of fat, right? Why is it a problem? Well, because once you get above about 20% above your ideal body weight, which is your height and weight and, and sex, um, it, you start to have some really significant risk factors for health problems. And it's an epidemic. We consider obesity actually a disease, okay? And, and so I think that's, uh, some of my patients are always surprised when I say that, um, but it is a disease and it is a problem and we need to treat it as if it's like a cancer, okay? I think of it the same, the same way. Cancers can come back, obesity can come back after treatment, right? So really need to attack it as a disease process. 78.6 million Americans are obese. That's a third of our population in the country considered obese. That's highest in the world, as you can imagine. Um, Delaware, right now, 30.7% of our patients are considered obese, ranked 17th out of 50 states. Um, that's in 2014. In 2004, during that census, our population had an obesity rate of 17%. In 10 years, we went from 17 to 30%. And that we're seeing across the country. Even Colorado, we just talked about Colorado, healthiest state in the country, uh, used to be below 30%, just hit 30% on the last census. It's a huge population that we're, that we're trying to treat. This is just kind of a breakdown of of where a lot of this falls. Um, Non-Hispanic blacks actually have the highest rate of obesity at almost 50%. That's a, that's a, large, that's a large, significant portion of that population. Middle-aged adults, 39.5%. We're seeing a huge increase in our pediatric obesity rates. 
I was just on the phone this past week with uh, the bariatric surgeon who operates out of AI DuPont. And he's bringing me on board down there so that we can take care of that population more aggressively because it just is becoming very burdensome. We have 17, 16 year olds that are on dialysis, that are on blood pressure medication, that have diabetes, right? Significant health problems that a 16 year old should not be dealing with. So it's, it is an epidemic. What is morbid obesity? Has, you guys heard this terminology in the news, right? Morbid obesity? It sounds awful, doesn't it? They're trying to change the name. I'm actually hesitant to change the name because I want it to be scary. I want it to incite a little bit of fear that we need to get healthy, okay? But they probably will change this over the next couple of years. Morbid obesity means that the patient has now become 100 pounds over their ideal body weight. And what that translates into is a BMI or body mass index of 40 or higher. Body mass index is a really important number. That's your height versus weight ratio. Now, I will tell you that like in bodybuilders that have all muscle and really, they have high BMIs, but that's because it's a little thrown off there. But your average patient, this is a really important number, okay? You can look it up on Google, on my website through Christiana. We even have a little BMI calculator on the right side. Um, because this is the number that puts us into certain ranges. So morbid obesity over 40. Um, and this is also what insurances are looking for when a patient is seeking weight loss surgery. We base a lot of it on this because it's based on research. Okay, so when you start to get 100 pounds over your ideal body weight, this is really what we call clinically severe obesity because your risk of medical problems skyrockets at this point. We're going to talk about those in just a second. So first, what causes it, right? If it was one simple thing that caused morbid obesity, we'd make a pill for it, we'd cure it, and we wouldn't be here talking about it, right? And if that happens down the line, I'd be the happiest person, okay? But the fact of the matter is, it's not just one thing. And I'll tell you a little bit about those pills that are on the market in a couple slides. So it's genetic factors, certainly, absolutely. So we see obesity run in families. But it, I think more so than the genetic within our family, it's our eating habits that we learn in that family structure. So foods we learn to eat, the way we use to prepare them as kids, we prepare them as adults. We find comfort in certain foods, certainly. Um, and we get into that habit. It's an environment, too. We're, as a nation, we're running around trying to meet all these deadlines, get our kids off to soccer, get to work in time, you know. Breakfast is usually skipped by most Americans, all right? We're getting home from work. We got to pick up the kids. We're going to grab a pizza on the way home, fast food. It's amazing how many of my patients have fast food for breakfast, even. Um, you know, when, when people are at work, they get maybe a half hour lunchtime break or a 15 minutes break in the morning and afternoon. Typically, those, those minutes are spent eating, not going out and walking. So a lot of it has to do with environment and lack of exercise too. I mean, we're not, we're not hunter-gatherers anymore, and we are you know, certainly not even farming the lands anymore, a lot of us. You know? So what we're doing is we're sitting in a cubicle all day. We're not getting our steps in. And even if you get 10,000 steps a day, that doesn't always translate into weight loss. And the American Heart Association definitely wants you to get those 10,000 steps, and they're super important. But it's when we get our heart elevated during that exercise, that's when we really start to burn fat. Okay? So um, it's all these things kind of working, working together against us. And this is why we do surgery right here. And so this is my first of two favorite slides that you're going to see. People don't always think about a lot of these disease processes in relationship to obesity. You think about some of them, like diabetes, right? Diabetes is one of those disease processes that scares me terribly for patients because diabetes attacks it's not, it's not just a sugar issue, right? It attacks your eyes, your kidneys, your blood vessels, stroke risk go up, heart attack risk go up. It attacks your fingers, your toes, right? Patients get amputations, it attacks your kidneys, you get on dialysis, right? So it, it really attacks the whole system. So certainly that's up there, right? High blood pressure is up there, high cholesterol, things that we really do think about a lot. Gallbladder disease, right? We have a lot of patients that undergo gallbladder disease because that is, you know, over, patients with obesity can form stones. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, this is one of those hidden things that we tend not to talk about so um, 
so, so often in the office, especially if you're with your primary care physician, but it's really important. Non-alcoholic fatty li liver disease, which is, just means that there's a lot more li uh, fat in the liver than there should be, is now replacing hepatitis virus as the number one cause for cirrhosis and liver failure. So, and we don't really screen for it. The only thing that we can do to treat it is weight loss. There's nothing else we can do. And we don't, we don't screen for it, and it's really just an ultrasound. And I will tell you that the, the diet that we're going to talk about in a little bit that I take my patients through for the two weeks before surgery is attacking that in particular because the heavy liver sits right on the stomach where I need to operate. But it's, a, it's, it's pretty epidemic. and a, I mean, most of my patients have some degree of fatty liver. Obstructive sleep apnea. So a lot of my patients come in and they don't know they have this, which is scary. But they know they snore, or at least their partners know they snore, right? They, they usually don't know that they snore. They're tired during the day and they snore terribly. So I send a lot of them out for sleep studies and the majority come back with obstructive sleep apnea. So they get the CPAP machine that they wear at night to help them breathe better, get more restful sleep, and be more active during the day. Um, really one of the main things here for treatment is weight loss. Because you have a lot of neck weight, a lot of chin weight, all that sitting right onto your airway as you lay flat. Um, and having that come down certainly alleviates. And most of my patients are off their CPAP machine within six months after surgery. Um, I have a lot of women with infertility that come to me. A lot of women with infertility. Polycystic ovarian disease. And that's because estrogen gets stored in fat cells. And so a patient who's obese has more estrogen. So it just throws off the whole hormonal bo uh, balance. And they end up with infertility issues. So I have a surprising number of patients who get pregnant within a year <laughs> because they think that they can't get pregnant. Uh, but once they start losing that weight and the hormones really start to balance out, a lot of those infertility issues resolve. And then over to the right there, I'm kind of saving it for last, that cancer thing, right, with the C word over there. Really scary. And actually, uh, DelawareHealth.gov, two winters ago now, put out this huge campaign to talk to the community about the cancer risk associated with obesity. And patients have a 10% increased risk of all types of cancer if they're obese. 10% increased risk, that's a lot. Now women have a 41% increased risk of developing endometrial or uterine cancer if they're obese. Now mind you, uterine cancer is not what we test for at the GYN's office, that's cervical cancer. So this is something we don't even screen for and patients are at a 41 increased risk of developing it if they're obese. So what does all of this really add up to? Early death, right? And so we're actually seeing the life expectancy in the United States start to level off, which is scary. Right? It's not going up anymore. And a lot of it has to do with everything on this slide. Our population isn't as healthy as it once was. Um, so it's really plateaued. And so now there's a push for not only treating obesity, but preventing it. We're starting to really see that push for prevention. It's not great, I will admit. Um, but hopefully, we really start to see that push over the next decade. OK, so scared. All right, so now that was a real downer. I'm sorry. But we're going to talk about all the good things that we can do to help treat these patients. Um, so it's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of my patients will go to their primary care physician, and they sit down with their doctor, and they say, all right, you have to lose weight. Easier said than done, right? It's, it's really hard. And if you don't have the tools to really figure out how to do that, it's really difficult. Um, so we're going to talk about some different options that are out there. So this is a nice comparison study. So um, we're going to be talking about average waste, weight loss and excess weight loss at five years. Um, so in that first line there, placebo, a sugar pill, right? Patients don't know it's a sugar pill, but it, that's, that's, you know, it's kind of like something that we can compare it to. So if I told a patient, I'm going to give you this pill, and this pill is going to help you lose weight, they'll lose some weight. It's a, it's a little mind over matter, but they'll lose some weight. And 5% is OK. You don't get a lot of health benefits there, but it's still pretty good. But that's lost long term, right? Because it's really just a sugar pill. So let's compare that to diet and behavior modification. I have a lot of patients that take Herbalife, SlimFast, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, all those things. A lot of the problem with those is that and Weight Watchers is usually pretty good, but things like Herbalife, 
that's a complete replacement. We're not teaching patients anything different. So as soon as they come off of that program, the weight comes back because the building blocks haven't changed. The diet and exercise hasn't changed. But it will, while patients are on it, get about a 10% weight loss. So if a patient has 100 pounds to lose, they'll get about 10 pounds off, okay? And that is really good. You start to see some health benefits with that, so that's great. The problem is that a lot of those programs are hard to maintain long term. They cost money, they're a complete meal replacement, and you can't live on shakes for the rest of your life. It's just not, not a good thing. So you don't see those benefits out long term. Now drug therapy. The drugs we're talking about here, Contrave, Belvique, Phentermine, not Fen, Fen, right? That's off the market. We're not talking about that one, okay? Uh, Invokana. There's a bunch of different meds that are out there, okay? Orlistat. So in order for these medications to get approved by the FDA for weight loss, they had to show a, at least a 10% excess weight loss in their clinical trials. So guess what they hit? 10%. Not, not, not even over. 10% period. So they hit it. So that's how they got through. So, and they're good. They do what they're supposed to do. If, if a patient is placed on Phenermine, usually if they have 100 pounds to lose, they will lose about 10 pounds, okay? It only works for as long as patients are taking it. So as soon as you come off those medications, the weight tends to come back. Uh, plus, there's a lot, of, a lot of side effects to those. Orlistat causes terrible diarrhea. Phenermine can cause some really fast heart rates and high blood pressures, um, so they have to be monitored. Um, but if patients want to jumpstart their weight loss, this is a good option, as long as they're also working with a dietitian and they're starting to exercise more. So it's a great way to jumpstart that weight loss. So as long as you're changing those building blocks, this will be incredibly successful. And the next three things here are our surgeries that we offer um, nationwide. Now, I include band, although I actually don't place bands, and I'll tell you why in a couple slides. Um, but the gastric band is what I would consider the Cadillac of bariatric surgery. It's been around the longest. It's changed the most. You know, patients originally, when they had the bypass, they had a big open in surgery. They were in the ICU for days. They're really sick patients. My bypass patients have five small incisions, and they go home the day after. Um, so it's a totally different surgery than it was 10, 15 years ago. But patients lose weight and they will lose about 80% in the first year and a half after surgery, which many people ask, is that safe? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and as long as patients follow up with their bariatric surgeon, which I encourage all my patients to see me on a, at least a yearly basis after that first year, they can maintain that weight because the bypass doesn't stop working. What tends to happen is patients stop working with the bypass. You've got to follow the diet and, and exercise recommendations. But as long as patients are seeing me, it's that, that accountability. I know I'm going to see Dr. Halbert in three months. I better get my stuff together, right? So, and I catch them if they're gaining five pounds, usually not 50 pounds, right? So we can just keep everyone in the bumpers. So that weight can be maintained. The sleeve is a newer procedure that really started coming into vogue around 2010, 2011, but we had been doing it far longer because it was a two-part surgery with the duodenal switch. And what that was is we would do the sleeve first, patients would go out for maybe a year, and then come back and do the second part of the surgery called the duodenal switch. But patients wouldn't come back because they did really well with the sleeve itself. So then we started doing it as a standalone procedure. And it does a really nice job, and we're gonna talk about why for both of these surgeries. Um, it gives you about 70% weight loss, and that again is in about the first year and a half. The last one there is a gastric band. We're going to talk about the gastric band. We're going to talk about the problems with the gastric band. It was good in its heyday for certain folks. Bariatric surgeons tended to put these bands in everybody, though, and that became the problem. You have to be really picky on who was getting the surgery. But regardless, there was a lot of different expectations. Patients would lose about 50% of their excess body weight loss, and that was a slower weight loss. So it happened around two to three years out from surgery. So it was a little different. But again, with any of these, as long as patients are following up and following the recommendations, they can maintain that weight. Okay. So we're talking surgery, and it's funny because um, I think the stigma is really starting to change, but still out there and permeates into our community sometimes, where we say weight loss surgery is the easy way out. You know, it's, it's you, you know, are you, you're, you're getting surgery, why don't you just work a little harder? Trust me, weight loss surgery is not easy. It's, you know, it is a process. 
Um, but the rewards are, we'll talk about the rewards. I, I, I had the best job in the whole world. I told you this already. So um, I get to see these patients on the other side. You know, and so weight loss surgery is the best option that we have for patients that are especially morbidly obese. It's the most effective thing that we have out there and is the longest lasting option that we have. So who is a candidate? I think this is important, and I, I was questioning whether I should put this in here, but I think it's important to know we're not just operating on everybody who's overweight. We're talking about morbidly obese patients with a BMI over 40 or patients between 35 and 40 that have a medical problem high blood pressure, diabetes especially, obstructive sleep apnea, those are the big ones, okay? The insurance companies want patients to undergo, they, they want them to fail, right? It's a horrible way of saying it, failure of non-surgical means. What they want you to do is go through nutrition classes before surgery, which we mandate every single one of my patients to do. And that's universal across the country. Um, because if we were to take a patient, have them come in and tomorrow do a sleeve on them, holy moly, it would not be successful. It would just not be successful. We have to change the building blocks. We have to get the education in there about good diet and exercise. And if that's not working, the surgery won't work, okay? And patients need to be committed. This isn't something that they're gonna do for six months and then, you know, go back to eating. No, 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 this is a, this is a complete lifestyle change. You know, stacking your house with different foods, picking different things off the menu at a restaurant. Um, committing time in your week to exercise. All of those things have to be maintained and you have to be really ready to commit. So what's out there? We have the gastric bypass, we have the sleeve gastrectomy, we have the lap band we're trying to talk about. We briefly talked about the Duana switch. I do a lot of revisional surgery now. So I take out a lot of bands and I convert a lot of bands to other surgeries too. So it's kind of all of these band to bypass, band over bypass, I don't do band over bypass. And then some, you know, some people even do sleeve to duodenal switch. So. But so there's a lot of, you know, different ways that this is, you know, we treat our patients. But let's talk about what's happened over the last couple of years. So gastric bypass, ruin wise, RNY, used to be one of our most popular surgeries. We know that it's very good at what it does, but you can see the numbers over the last couple of years, and this has declined even more since 2015, have, have come down. The band numbers, this is a dramatic decrease, right? It was something that we put in a third of our patients. Now less than 6%, and actually it's now less than about 3%. Used to be two manufacturers of the gastric band. One of them has pulled out of the market. I suspect the second one is going too soon as well. Um, but it, we just found that there were a lot of faults in it, and we'll talk about that. Where the, these numbers are getting picked up in is the sleeves. We do a lot of sleep procedures, and probably in my patient population, patients that are coming in for the first time for a surgery, about 60% of them will have a sleeve gastrectomy. And you'll see why. It's a little bit easier to understand. Um, and that actually is a really good thing for patients. Um, and then we do a lot of revisions, a lot of bands getting removed and revising to some other surgery. So we do a lot of those. And then there's this other stuff. Balloons, right? You guys heard about the gastric balloons, something called V-block, something called a spire assist. Anyone hear about that one? The, the tube in the stomach? Yeah. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about those. Controversial, for sure. All right, so let's start with the gastric bypass. This is essentially what it looks like, but I'm going to show it to you in a video form. Hopefully this video is going to play. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so we make these small incisions. This, this patient has six incisions. I actually use five. We use these instruments to get play. We don't dart them in from across the room. Like you're, you're asleep, and we gently place them, and it's, it's, yeah. So, But they become our conduits that we use our instruments through. And we blow the abdomen up with CO2 so that we have working space inside. We use these great stapling and cutting devices so there's no spillage of gastric contents while we're doing this. And we create a pouch away from the rest of the stomach. It's about half the size of my fist, about three to five ounces, and that's how much somebody can eat at one time. That pouch has to empty somewhere. So we take a piece of small bowel and we hook it up to that pouch. And you can see we make another connection downstream, okay? So this is how it works. The blue is the food that's coming down. The yellow is all the digestive enzymes. And they're not meeting each other until much further downstream. So we are purposely not allowing absorption of the calories until much further downstream. So you're only, you're, we're really limiting how much, much you absorb. Certainly we could overdo it, right? We could, we could make it really malabsorb. We've hit a really good number and a really good place with the bypass that's safe, safe long-term for our patients. But it also means it's really important to get your vitamins in. 
because you're not absorbing all your vitamins. So that becomes part of it too. Um, so it works by restricting how much you can eat and not allowing absorption. And then there's another component to the bypass, the hormone component, which we're still figuring out. I mean, they're still, they're, they're still amazed because my, I'll give you an example, my diabetes patients come off insulin the day after surgery. So they're getting the health benefits and the hormonal changes immediately after surgery, well before the weight comes off, well before. So the inside's working, and I tell them that the weight loss is just this added benefit that they get, because really the health benefits is getting rid of that diabetes. Um, so we're still trying to figure out everything uh, when it comes to this, but it's amazing what we are finding out. Patients are not hungry, typically, after the bypass. They get full very quickly, obviously. Um, my patients, a lot of them will actually set timers on their phone every two to three hours to remind themselves to eat. And food becomes less of a want and more of just a necessity, okay? It's not living to eat, it's eating to live. Okay, that's, that's the change that tends to happen after surgery. All right, the gastric sleeve. So it's not a physical sleeve that goes over the summer. That's a misnomer, and that's actually called a gastric vest that is out there. Uh, not FDA approved yet, so, but this is, we're taking away about 70 to 80 percent of the stomach. And again, we're using those laparoscopic instruments, blowing the belly up with CO2. Patients are asleep the whole time, by the way. They're not waking up during this, okay? There's no light sedation. They're completely asleep during this. Same stapling and cutting devices, and we take away about 80 percent of the stomach. The stomach comes out, it's about eh, 12 to 15 centimeters long. It's a big piece of stomach. I get it out through an incision about the width of my thumb. Okay, so we're not making some big incision to get that stomach out. The part of the stomach that gets removed also contains a hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin is that hormone that makes you hungry. So again, a lot of these patients do not get hungry after surgery and have to set timers or reminders to eat. And so they end up eating, instead of three large meals a day, about five small meals, which is really a, a big, a good recommendation for any patient. Um, but it's definitely encouraged after bariatric surgery. Okay, a lot of people just call this the banana surgery because the stomach ends up looking like a banana at the end of the surgery. Okay, the gastric band. That gastric band is an imp implant. Um, and so the way this works is that it's outpatient surgery, laparoscopic. The band gets placed around the top por portion of the stomach, at the very, very top. And there's a cushion on the inside of that band that connects to this catheter to this port. And this port gets placed underneath the skin on the abdominal wall. So if you push down on a patient's skin right there, you can feel the port. If anyone is familiar with a chemo port, right? Same idea, except chemo ports are typically up here. This is now down in the stomach, okay? It's the abdominal region. So um, what happens is a couple weeks after that surgery, they come into the office. We use a special needle to go through the skin into the port and start injecting saline into it that tightens the cushion around the top part of the stomach and restricts how much can get through there at a time. The problem with the band is that you're still hungry. The rest of that stomach is still there. Those hormones are still working. So what happens is patients really have a difficult time being satisfied. They tend to overeat with this, stretch out that pouch, stretch out their esophagus, end up with a lot of reflux, um, and the weight loss is just not as good. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more in a couple slides. And then, all right, so I picked the most confusing slide possible for the duodenal switch, but essentially what the duodenal switch is, is the sleeve plus a bypass. So think about that, the sleeve at the very top, and then we bypass the bowel and create that Y component where the food and the digestive enzymes are separated, again here. This fell out of favor a couple years ago. We were doing a lot of these about 15, 20 years ago. We stopped doing them because patients had significant malabsorption, a lot of vitamin deficiencies to the point where they were hospitalized for those vitamin deficiencies. Now we have a much better support for our patients set up, so they tend to be okay, but we highly select these patients, really have to really carefully vet these patients because we have to make sure they're gonna be compliant with their vitamins and they have to follow up every six months in the office. And that's a lot, it's a lot. All right, so I can tell you all the good things about these surgeries, and I, you know, I still have even a couple more slides to talk about how good they are, but I can also tell you the risk, because you're gonna hear about these things, and, and you, know, you kind of would hear maybe dumping syndrome and things like that out there, in the, and I think it's good to educate yourself on what exactly some of these things are. Um, gastric bypass patients, 
you know, they suffer a lot of these, and I'm going to pick out a few of them. So in the gastric bypass, patients need to avoid smoking. If I tell all my patients to avoid smoking, I'm actually kind of a, I'm, I'm pretty rough on my patients that smoke. I, I get on my soapbox and I tell them if they're coming to me to get healthy, that means they're getting healthy 100%. And that means off cigarettes. So I actually will test them for nicotine right before surgery uh, to make sure that they're not smoking. Why? Because smoking can cause ulcers. Ulcers can happen because this part of the bowel is not used to seeing the acid from this little portion of the stomach. And so it starts to break down the barrier, smoking does, break down the barriers of this small bowel and allow ulcers to form. And ulcers cause life-threatening bleeding, cause holes in the bowel, and that means emergency surgery. So uh, really bad consequences for smokers. The other thing that can do that, uh, other than smoking, is uh, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, those type of medications. So those patients that have had the bypass can't have those medications because they're also prone to ulcers. Hernias can happen. When I bring that small bowel up to meet that pouch, I create two spaces where the rest of the bowel can twist into and like a Chinese finger trap can't get out. The good thing is I know where those two spaces are and I close them at the time of surgery. So we tend not to see those very often. Dumping syndrome. So if you know somebody that has had the surgery, you've might heard, you might have heard them talk about dumping syndrome. What it is is that this portion of the small bowel is not used to seeing sugar directly. It's usually broken down by the time it gets to that part of the small bowel. And so it sees the sugar and it starts to freak out. And it takes the, the, the fluid from your blood vessels, takes it out of the blood vessels and starts dumping it into the small bowel to dilute the sugar because it doesn't know what else to do. So patients, their blood pressure start to drop. They get a little woozy. They don't really, you know, they get a little clammy. Sometimes they even pass out. That's the first part of dumping syndrome. The second part of dumping syndrome is now we've got all this fluid in the bowel, hence the name, they're running to the bathroom, right? It doesn't happen to all my patients. It doesn't happen every time they have a piece of sugar, but I warn my patients not to test theories while they're like driving on 95, right? You're just gonna be careful about it, so. Um, but it can happen. I had one patient who would have it every time, just the first portion of it actually, um, every time she had a bowl of strawberries, because strawberries have a lot of sugar, a lot of fruit does. And uh, she didn't recognize it because she didn't have the diarrhea afterwards. So I said, why don't you cut back on the strawberries and add a little non-sugary thing on the side with it. So she did that, symptoms went away. So it's really just diet modification for this kind of stuff. Vitamins, 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 super important. I have another side at the end, but really vitamins are the most important thing. People always ask, what is the pill that I need to take for the rest of my life after a bypass? Vitamins. But if you can take the metoprolol and the hydrochlorothiazide and the insulin and all those things and you can get rid of them and just replace it with a vitamin, that's a win in my book. Absolutely. So the sleeve. The sleeve um, can have leaks a little bit higher rate, and leaks happen typically up here. That's because it's a high pressure tube. The bypass is actually very low pressure, but the sleeve is a high pressure tube. So if there's anything that weakens that top staple line, it can cause a leak. And it happens at about a rate of one to two percent. I'm actually the one in the state of Delaware that takes care of any leaks that happen in this area, and also from places like Mexico, because people still go to Mexico to have the sleeve and they come back. Um, so I've taken care of a lot of patients here. It typically does not require surgery. What I usually do is place a stent on the inside to coat the inside, allow stuff to still pass through, but it's protecting where that stomach needs to heal that leak. And patients typically do very well. The other thing here that I want to point out is the sleeve is pro reflux basically, pro heartburn. So patients that have some kind of baseline heartburn after the sleeve will have terrible heartburn potentially. And so I usually counsel them over to the bypass because the bypass was originally created as an anti-reflux procedure. So it actually treats it. So, but in this, this patient population, they should not have a sleeve. And then the last thing here is dilation. People always worry, um, I'm gonna stretch out my sleeve, I'm gonna stretch it out, stretch it out, stretch it out. And uh, that doesn't happen unless you work really hard at it. So patients have to overeat and overeat and overeat and overeat. And yes, that does stretch out. Do I go back and kind of re-trim up? No, because I'm not fixing the underlying problem there. So I tend not to do that. So I tell my patients, you gotta really protect what we're doing so that this becomes a lifelong surgery for you. And the adjustable band, right? Okay, now we're gonna get into it. So the band has things, has problems that we know now. Um, this, is not, this is fixed with taking this part of the stomach and wrapping it over top, but the stomach is mobile. The stomach stretches. So what happens is it tends to slide down on the stomach. 
more stomach than goes through the band. It's much tighter. There's much more tissue than going through the band. It becomes an emergency in some cases because it starts to cut off the blood supply. The band needs to come out. The other thing that happens is ulcers can cr be created on the inside. This tends to happen actually with smokers in particular. Um, and the band will erode through the wall of the stomach. I have gone to the operating room with a patient, put a scope down, so went in through the mouth, in the esophagus, inside the stomach, and saw a complete band sitting in there and took it out. So it eroded all the way through. Usually not painful, actually. So patients don't always know that's happening. Um, it happens over, obviously, a long period of time. And then the pouch dilation. That dilation from overeating on a band will stretch out the esophagus. And when you stretch out the esophagus, the esophagus doesn't work well. So patients end up getting really bad reflux. So what does that translate into all these things? 20% of patients, and this is based on research that came out a couple months ago, 20% of patients that had a band will have another surgery related to their band within five years of placement. A third of patients will have their bands removed at 10 years. So most large institutions now have gone away from placing the band. Do I care for a lot of band patients? Yes, I do. Do I take out a lot of bands? Yes, I do. But if a patient's band is working and they're still getting really good effect from that, we just work with them. All right, so this is what happens to patients after surgery. They have really good results, by and large. Um, and it, sometimes patients just come in to see me on a yearly basis to brag. They come in and tell me all the great things they're doing with their life and the new job they have or this. I mean, their confidence is through the roof. Their energy is through the roof. Um, I had one lady come in, and she sat down in the chair, and she had this, like, weird smirk on her face <laughs> across her arms. I tied my shoes today the coolest thing, right? She's been wearing slip-ons for years because she can't reach her shoes. Um, I have a lot of patients that uh, fly now where they didn't travel before because they didn't want to sit on an airplane seat. They couldn't fit into an airplane seat, okay? Um, they go out to eat more often because they can fit into a chair at a restaurant. It's the coolest thing. I, 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 did I tell you I have the best job in the whole world? It's the, these are the reasons why I do it, to see those. It, I get the best Christmas cards every year uh, from my patients. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how much hugs, Dr. Gillespie, I get a lot of hugs in my office. Um, the biggest regret that patients have is that they didn't have it sooner, by and large. Even the patients that have a complication from a leak that I take care of, you get them over that, they're still happy that they had the surgery done because the end result is pretty profound. Um, and they get improvement illnesses. So this is, after, this is after the bypass, but it really extends over to the sleeve for most of them, except for the reflux. So reflux resolution rates, off medications, no heartburn, 72 to 98% resolved. That's equal to the other anti-reflux procedures that we do. Um, diabetes, 83% resolved. Hypertension, high blood pressure, right? Your cardiologist will give you metoprolol, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, right? This cures it, off medications. 52 to 92 percent resolve. It's a little low on that one just because there's a genetic component in a lot of patients. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 90 percent improvement in the amount of fatty deposition. Right? I mean, I, migraines, 57 percent improved. A lot of migraines has to do with the pro-inflammatory response of our body in, related to obesity. So if you look at the bottom here, quality of life improved in 95 percent of patients. Mortality, 89% reduction, so reduction in the risk of death five years out from surgery. There are not many surgeries out there that by having them, you gain years back on your life. These, these surgeries give you life back where you didn't have it before. All right, so let's get into a little fun stuff here. We got a couple minutes. Um, so you may also hear about a bunch of this fun stuff that's out there. Fun because it's so different. And it's using technology. Um, in a different way. So let's go, through, let's go through each of them. So first we're going to talk about the intergastric balloons. Right now there are three of them that are FDA approved, the Reshape, the Orbera, the Obalon. The first two are fluid filled. The last one is uh, filled with a mixture of gases. So these are the three. The first one on the left there is a Reshape. It's a dual balloon. There's a connecting rod between the two, uh, but it makes it sit you know, pretty nicely in the stomach. Um, the one in the middle there is the Obalon. That is, again, liquid-filled. It's one large balloon. And the one on the right there, it doesn't actually float. It's not full of helium. But that's the Obalon. And you actually have three of those placed sequentially, two weeks apart. So how is this performed? So for the fluid-filled ones, these are placed endoscopically. This is the reshaped balloon. This is the, actually the one that I've been, I've done these balloons before. 
um, and worked with Reshape, and we're actually working to try to get this over to Christiana. Um, but it's an endoscopic procedure outpatient. We place the endoscope down, and then we deploy the balloons within the stomach. And under direct visualization, we blow up each of those balloons with the fluid. And the fluid actually has methylene blue in it, so it's stained blue. So for some reason, over the six months that those balloons are in, if one of them goes down, you pee green. So we usually have an indicator that something's going on. I like the reshape because it's two balloons. So if one of the balloons goes down, the other one keeps it in the stomach. It doesn't allow it to pass through the bowels, which can cause blockage, emergency surgery. So that's actually why I'm a big, big proponent of the reshape. Um, I'm not paid to say that, but I do really like the concept of the reshape. The problem is when you place a large balloon, this is about uh, half a liter of fluid, inside the, a patient's abdomen, they're sick for a little while because their stomach is trying to get rid of that. It's a foreign body filled with fluid. It's heavy. It's about two, three pounds sitting in the stomach. For about two to three days, patients are nauseous. They're throwing up. They're not happy campers. You get beyond that time period, and we're just kind of holding hands, getting them through. It's going to be fine. Give them anti nausea medication. They get through to the other side. They do great, and they can keep the balloons in for a total of six months. They have to come out at six months. Scary thing is that they're placing these in Mexico, and they bring them back up here, and the patients are keeping them in sometimes longer than they should be. They're not going back down to Mexico to have them out at six months. Not a good idea. We haven't studied these further than six months. Um, they're really to jumpstart weight loss. They are not permanent. So this is not for our patients that need to lose 100 pounds. This is more for our patients that need to lose like 40 pounds. Okay. I get a lot of patients that are recent empty nesters, for example, or you know they have a wedding coming up, something like that, and they want to really get their health together. That's where we're seeing this being used. The problem is that this isn't covered by insurance. So this is a cash pay procedure as it is right now. It's questionable how the insurance companies are going to see this. We've got to see longer data on whether the weight loss is sustainable after the balloon co balloons come out for the insurance company to see benefit in it. There, the other balloon is the Obalon. I was actually part of the clinical trials for Obalon. Uh, this is a pill. It's a big pill. Okay, this is the pill balloon. The, uh, it, it, so it's about that big. It's big. And we actually have to test you to make sure you could swallow it before the actual. So if you can imagine, you got to swallow this thing tw not twice, four times total, because it's three balloons that are placed two weeks apart. So we give you a trial, trial pill balloon, and it's connected to a catheter when the balloon actually goes in. So you're swallowing not only that big pill, but now there's a catheter that's coming out through your stomach, out through your mouth, and that's how we get the gases into the stomach, and we look at it under an x-ray to watch it get expanded. It's an interesting procedure. Let me just put it to you that way. We don't do it here in Delaware yet. It may happen. I don't know. But um, it, it, it's a little gag worthy. But patients still get pretty good weight loss with it. We stack three balloons two weeks apart because it helps with the immediate nausea afterwards. So patients tend not to have as much with the oval on. The balloons are smaller. Okay. So we know it works. Patients can lose some pretty good weight. And it's, it, it again, is it's not the only thing that's helping people lose weight. They really have to um, adhere to the diet and exercise regimen. They really have to start changing things um, for them to get the results. There's a vagus neuromodulator called the V-Block uh, made by Maestro. Um, this actually is covered by some insurances, and we're going to be getting this in here at Christiana over the next couple of years here. But the V-Block is a pacemaker, just like a heart pacemaker, works very similarly. Pace it around the vagus nerve, and what happens is it, it actually stimulates the vagus nerve until it stops. The vagus nerve is what makes us digest food, so we're blocking it. So what happens is you're not as hungry, and you get fuller faster. The weight loss is certainly not as fast, and I'll get to that, but it's sustainable weight loss. This is a permanent pacemaker that gets placed. And we can titrate it, so we can kind of dial up a little bit. And so we're getting to a place where patients, instead of eating this much, only feel the need to eat this much. They don't have to change any of their actual foods they're putting in, but we encourage, obviously, a dietitian so we can um, change the eating habits. Okay. And the last one here that we're going to talk about is the Aspire cyst, gastric emptying system. So this is a tube. It's an endoscopic procedure. It's outpatient. It is reversible. It's cash pay, believe it or not, because it's not covered by insurance. Um, but it's placed just like a feeding tube. If you've ever heard, you know, kids with little Mickey tubes and, and adults with feeding tubes, same idea. 
but there's a long tube on the inside, so you can start to see it right here. This is the long tube on the inside with holes all throughout it. There's a port on the surface of the abdominal wall that's pretty flat. And so when patients go out to dinner, bear with me, they have to chew their food really well. 30 minutes after dinner, if they're still at the restaurant, they go into the bathroom. They hook up this device you see here. It comes in a little bag about this big. It's got a little water reservoir, so you pump the water back into the stomach, and then you pour it out in the toilet. I kid you not, this actually exists. You can see my, my little bias about it. I feel like this is not teaching good habits. There's apparently studies out there that say that patients don't eat more if they have this by the Spirosis company. Now, if it were me, I might have that extra ice cream at night. If I had this tube in, I could just dump it out. But I don't do this for my patients. And I think that's really important. So even though it's FDA approved, doesn't mean we have to do it. We got to do the safest thing by our patients. So this is out there. People pay money for it. Mm -hmm. All right, so long-term post-op bariatric care. This is where Dr. Gillespie is going to come in. But I will tell you what I do for my patients. Post-op visits for the first year, I see them a lot. They become part of my family. We're a team. I'm basically the primary care doctor in a lot of sense. Um, I see them out from that first year yearly, unless they're a duodenal switch patient, then they're, they have to come in every six months. They get a full set of lab work, really focusing in on the vitamins that they need. Um, and then we start to trim back their medications. We offer support groups so they can talk to other people, because everyone has good days and bad days, so we want to make sure all the good days are outnumbering the bad days. And they consider body contouring surgery, which we're going to see a little bit of. Like I said before, patients have to take their vitamins. Absolutely important. That's why we constantly check up on them. So when patients are ready and committed, I'm ready to help them and give them really good results, really get their, their health back on track. I love this quote. I showed this to one of my patients today, actually, in the office. Um, it's not easy. It's a process. Patients go through three, six months of nutrition. They have to see a cardiologist. They have to see a pulmonologist. We got to get them healthy as possible. Full set of lab work. We do an endoscopy before surgery. The surgery itself, we got to change their diet. They're on liquid for two weeks, then puree, then a soft diet for a month. They can't have bread. They can't have red meat after surgery. Um, they can't even have salads, actually, for six months because it's too bulky. They've got to give up alcohol. Got to give up any smoking. It's hard. But the results pay back in dividends. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie was a resident with me. He was a year behind me, so I'm a little, I'm not older. But anyway, so, um, but he has been up at Temple, and he's finishing up a plastic surgery fellowship, and he is actually coming back to the state of Delaware, and we're going to be working in conjunction for our patients to take care of them, because one of the things that patients actually ask me most about is what am I going to do with the excess skin when I lose weight, which is inevitable, right? Um, and so we really work closely with our plastic surgeon colleagues and, and help treat them. So Jack is going to talk today about what those patients go through because it's actually another surgery, right? Um, but it's pretty amazing. So he's going to show you all the really fun pictures today. So, and we'll take questions at the end if that's okay. All right. So without further ado, Dr. Gillespie. I may have to argue with you about having the best job in the world, though. Right. All right, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Caitlin, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is John Gillespie. Again, I was uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a Delaware native. I uh, went to Slews Yanham High School, U University of Delaware, from the Hocast in Wilmington area. Um, did a little traveling for uh, my medical school. Um, did, did some studies down in Grenada, which I uh, went to St. George's University. Then finished up my clinical workship uh, in Brooklyn in uh, Manhattan for two years. Then again, I came here, joined Caitlin in the plastic or the um, uh, general surgery program, um, became a board certified general surgeon after that, and decided that I wanted to further my training and did a three year plastic surgery and uh, reconstructive surgery up at uh, Temple University Hospital just in Philadelphia. Uh, finishing up that this coming June and then coming back to the area to uh, Christiana Care. Um, 
Again, areas of interest. Uh, one thing in my training up in Philadelphia is we have a large bariatric population. Uh, obesity, again, is a very large uh, issue in Philadelphia uh, as well as in Pennsylvania. So we do a lot of post-bariatric body contouring. Again, breast cancer reconstruction, we do a lot of uh, cosmetic and facial uh, aesthetics as well as abdominal wall reconstruction. Uh, again, various affiliations. So jumping into it, the, what, what goals uh, should you expect in, in, in body contouring? I'll kind of get into individual aspects of body contouring, what to expect after weight loss has occurred. Well, one, you are able to remove the redundant uh, amorphous excess skin that uh, uh, Dr. Halbert mentioned and the tighten the skin envelope. Um, you're able to tighten your abdominal wall musculature. One thing that we've noticed after um, uh, patients with morbid obesity lose that weight is that their abdominal muscles aren't in the location that they once were. Uh, these patients are at increased risk of hernias and things of that nature. The abdominal wall spreads, creating a laxity that can't be fixed with just um, diet and exercise. Um, and we offer part of the bon uh, body contouring procedure, which I'll get into a little later, to tighten the abdominal wall. Um, it's been shown in numerous studies that just doing that simple reapproximation of your ab muscles to uh, their original location uh, diminishes back pain, as well as gives you full function of your abdominal wall, allows you to uh, sit up uh, to various degrees, as well as uh, increase your strength. Um, again, you regain the youthful appearance of pretty much every part of your body. We, there's abdominal contouring for, or um, body contouring for your breasts, arms, abdomen, legs, back, buttocks, anywhere where once you lose the weight, the excess skin and uh, tissue become an issue. Um, again, a lot of these patients, and even before the weight loss, they have issues, something with called intertrago, which is rashes within the skin creases that can occur under your breasts, on your abdominal folds. And uh, patients, you know, they come to see me as well as Caitlin and complain about, hey, I have to use creams all the time, antibiotics, I'm getting uh, small wounds in these areas. And after they lose the weight, body contouring can remove that skin and abolish any needs for those medications. Um, again, you can alleviate upper and lower back pain, shoulder pain, bra strap grooving. Many of the uh, obese patients, uh, they have something called macromastia, which is uh, enlarged breasts, which they complain about bra strap grooving digging into their shoulders. They have excess uh, uh, skin on their back, which can, can contribute to upper as well as lower back pain. Um, and the procedures that we offer can alleviate these. Um, you can, again, approve ability to perform various activities, which um, People may take for granted, but the, the morbidly obese patients, you know, they're not able to walk, you know, they're not exercising, uh, just simple things like urinating. Uh, you know, people, um, they come in with poor health, they, they, hygiene, things of that nature become a real issue. Um, and something simple as sex, you know, uh, morbidly obese patients and obese patients, they have, they have difficulty expressed to us. And once they lose the weight and we offer them the skin removal surgeries, then they're able to get back to that lifestyle that they want. And that leads into the most important thing is their self-esteem uh, and improved body image. I mean, everybody wants the ideal body and after you lose the weight, then you know, the plastic surgery body contouring aspect of it can try and get you to that, that, that point. Now, again, just like Kate, uh, Caitlin mentioned that not everybody who walks in the door is eligible for these kind of procedures. So you kind of screen out who is eligible and some things you wanna uh, look at is your weight change. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, you know, some of these procedures, you don't see your total 70% uh, body uh, or weight loss until a year, a uh, year and a half out. So once you maintain your weight for at least six months or you reach your ideal goal of weight loss, then you come see us um, and we offer you the body contouring procedures. The last thing you want is to say you want to lose 100 pounds, you lose 50, you come see, see us, we remove the excess skin, and then you continue to lose another 50 pounds. Well, now we're right back in the same situation. Um, again, uh, any plans for future pregnancy? You're gonna gain weight on pregnancy. You're gonna stretch out those abdominal wall muscles again. Um, and it can kind of undo some of the things that we would have offered you up, up front. And again, this is very, very important, uh, nutrition and health status. 
Uh, vitamins, as Dr. Hablet had mentioned, are, are very, very important. Uh, the multivitamin, iron, zinc, things of those nature will, you know, obviously keep you healthy um, from, a, from the bariatric surgery standpoint, but it also improves wound healing um, and allows your body to regenerate and improve the overall uh, uh, healing effect from these multiple surgeries. And ideally, uh, we want a BMI less than 35. That, which is kind of just an average um, uh, BMI. However, the studies have shown that BMI is over 35. You have increased risks of wound healing complications and other complications such as blood clots and things like that. So we try and, uh, with the weight loss and the dieting and exercise, get you to an ideal body weight um, that is both stable uh, and, and healthy for your um, size. And again, can't, can't stress this enough, no smoking. Um, that exponentially uh, increases your risk of wound, wound complications. The last thing you want is to go through all this trouble, get uh, plastic surgery to you know, give you that ideal body image, and then run into complications with wounds. So we tell all our patients, and again, we also do screen for uh, um, the cotinin, which is uh, a byproduct of the nicotine that you smoke. Okay, so, so what is body contouring? I spoke a lot kind of about what we offer, but it includes your breasts first and foremost, uh, breast reduction surgery, breast lift surgery, um, and something called a mastopexy augmentation, which is also uh, some patients, uh, when they lose a lot of weight, their breasts become uh, deflated. Um, they, they lose uh, that fatty tissue within the breast. A lot of times, overweight patients, the fatty tissue kind of um, obliterate some of the natural breast tissue uh, that, uh, uh, that serves for lactation and things of that nature. So what we offer is also a lift as well as give them the size that they once had when they were younger. Uh, we also deal with male gynecomastia, which I'll show you a slide later on. Uh, same, same thing with women, um, with the estrogen that gets stored in uh, the fat cells. Men, uh, that, that with the excess fat, estrogen, it leads to uh, breast growth. Um, your abdomen and trunk. Uh, we offer surgeries called paniculectomies, which is excision or a removal of the excess tissue, and something called abdominoplasty, um, which is uh, the same thing as a paniculectomy, but then we tighten the abdominal musculature, which invariably 99% of our patients need. Um, there's various subsets of those procedures, which I'll get into later, the floor de lis the corset abdominoplasty, the belt lipectomy, the upper and lower, lower body lifts, and those deal with more, uh, with patients that have more uh, excess abdominal tissue. Rather than pulling the abdomen down to give you a nice flat stomach, some patients are also wider, and, and some of their fat con uh, continues around to their back and, and upper back. So we have to address these various um, areas with um, numerous procedures. Um, regarding arms, uh, patients, you know, they complain of, they say they have, oh, the bat wing arm or something like that. That's a procedure called a brachioplasty, where we thin out the, the arms and in similar fashion of the thighs. All right. And so going into breast reduction surgery, I just want to, there, there are some uh, pictures um, of intraoperative pictures as well as these various uh, anatomical locations. So I have to tell you there, there, there will be some uh, nudity in these pictures. So this is a, a standard patient, macromastia, something called ptosis. Ptosis is, a, um, is defined as a drooping of the breast lower than its normal anatomical location. As you see here, this is what a normal breast shape should look like. Um, the nipple areola complex is above the lower portion of the breast. This uh, lower portion of the breast sits in the fold of your breast. And then the grading goes up as the breast, parenchymal breast tissue descends to a certain degree and with it pulls the nipple with it. So grade three is, uh, is invariably seen in most of our bariatric population in which the weight, this, the, simply the weight of the breast over time pulls the nipple lower than the inframammary fold uh, and gives the ptosis as you can see here. Uh, as well as uh, the enlargement of the breasts, which is the, called the macromastia, which leads to the shoulder strap grooving, as you can see here. I don't know, it's kind of hard to see there. Um, as well as upper and lower back pain. OK. 
Okay. So breast reduction and lift. Uh, this is what we teach our residents. Um, there's, you don't just go in there and just kind of lift things up. This is, this is a lot more complicated than one may think. Uh, we have to know the anatomy of where the nerves are in the breast that give sensation to the nipple. Uh, no one wants a surgery where they leave with an insensate nipple or a numb nipple. Uh, so we've got to know that. We've got to know where uh, various blood vessels come from. There's numerous blood vessels uh, to the breast and patients who've had previous surgeries, previous reductions, or uh, cancer surgeries. They have various scars over their breast. We have to know which one of those scars has eliminated which one of those blood vessels so we can do those uh, procedures properly and again maintain blood flow to the breast and sensation to the nipple. And this kind of gets into something that we call a pedicle, which is the pedicle of tissue that's going to remain inside your breast. That's going to give you your breast shape. That's going to supply blood to your nipple. And what we move from a lower dependent portion of your breast up onto the natural um, location of your breast and wrap the skin around it to give the perkiness and prevent the ptosis. So these are various anatomical locations, this pink area, where we can position the pedicle uh, based upon, again, the blood flow. So if someone had uh, scars on the outside of their breast, we wouldn't want to do a, or make a pedicle from the outside of the breast because we know that blood flow has been uh, compromised. And again, you guys may have heard uh, the various uh, types of incisions, the anchor, the lollipop, the donut. These are all various types of incisions that one can do uh, a breast lift as well as a breast reduction. And some people come in and they demand, oh, we, I want the, the lollipop. That's, that's what I've seen on you know, various magazines and on TV and things like that. But these incisions are tailored to the individual patient. Not everybody can have a donut or a lollipop or, or there would be le or, uh, tissue would be left um, laterally and they wouldn't have the breast shape that they wanted. So you know, people have to come in, we have to kind of re-educate re-educate them on their expectations and what incisions need to be done to give them their ideal breast shape. So again, so how is the breast reduced? So we reduce the size and reposition the nipple and areola complex to a higher level on the breast. We reduce the overall, the overall size. Uh, we lift the breast onto a higher position on the chest wall to give you that grade one ptosis where the nipple is above the fold and just a little bit of breast tissue is below. Um, and again, you know, this is all about getting that natural shape back before um, the, the sequela of morbid obesity and things like that have set in. So the markings. We do a lot of markings. There's a lot of actual math and, and kind of uh, geometry associated with plastic surgery. You know, we, we mark 15 times and cut once. You know, that's, that's the standard uh, kind of idea. Uh, these are the various markings. You know, we, we, we mark from the sternal notch to the nipple to get to where we feel the nipple should lie on the inframammary fold. We want to know how much skin to remove. This, this woman, uh, she had very, she had, uh, she had 38 quadruple D breasts. And she would not be a candidate for a donut or a lollipop. Or you would never be able to remove all this tissue. So these are the patients that you come in, you, you, you gotta give them their expectations or, you know, they, they tell us their expectations and we tell them what we can do to give them the breast shape that they want. Uh, this patient uh, would receive a uh, anchor incision and we'll kind of go through a bunch of cases that kind of give you that, that idea. So here's some before and afters, what kind of to, to expect. Uh, what can, you know, plastic surgery and body contouring offer the post-bariatric um, or the uh, post-bariatric uh, 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 patient. So again, we go back to the picture that I just showed you. Okay, this is a 42-year-old female after losing 90 pounds. Okay, she still complained of back pain. She complained of a, a deflated breasts, sagging. You know, she wanted something done. You know, this was affecting her, her psyche, her overall, you know, um, well-being. So we marked her out, we brought her in for surgery. Again, we wanna make sure that she's healthy, she's not smoking, uh, she's maintained her weight loss, those, those three things that we spoke about before. 
and we reduced her breast both vertically as well as horizontally. We placed her nipple above her inframammary fold, and this is directly on the operative table. This is the immediate effect that you get. And over time, this only improves. As gravity takes hold, the breast settles into its natural teardrop position. Um, but immediately after surgery, you know, this patient lost about five pounds of breast tissue. And that may not seem like a lot from five, five pounds holding up a jug of milk or something, but when you take that off your shoulders and upper back, that's a huge life-changing event. Again, here's a patient who came in with 44 F breasts that her main complaint was she couldn't cook because her breasts were being burned on the stove. So again, you know, we can't do a donut on this woman. So these are things that you gotta tell them and immediately postoperatively, her breast is in, this is a uh, particular case that I, that, that I actually wanna show, I for, forgot to mention this, is that sometimes the distance between your sternal notch and where your nipple should be is drastically uh, too uh, long from where her nipple actually is. And we actually had to do a free nipple graft on this patient, meaning we actually take the nipple off, reconstruct the breast and put the nipple back on. So this is one of those cases where we have to tell the patient that she may not have sensation after the surgery. Um, and we only make those decisions uh, not lightly, we, we rarely, this is actually one of the one or two cases of removing the nipple that I ever had to do. But the problem is an unhealthy patient with a distance from her nipple to her sternal notches, once you make all your incisions, you remove all that blood supply, because the breast is hanging so low, it's so far removed from where the blood supply is, that there's risk that the nipple would potentially die if we didn't remove it and put it on healthier tissue that makes any sense. And you can ask me questions about this later. But again, immediately, size 44F breasts uh, reduced down to a uh, small D cup. Again, here's a woman, grade, grade three ptosis, shoulder strap grooving, uh, really bad upper back pain. Uh, deflated breasts, she had three kids. Uh, weight loss, she lost about 75 pounds. Uh, she complained that she didn't have any fullness of the upper part of her breast. As you can see, it's all chest wall. You can feel her ribs. All, her whole breast is below her breast crease. And after surgery, we, we gave her that, that fullness that she wanted. She wanted to be still pretty big. She didn't want to lose her size. She just wanted to be perkier. Um, and that's what we gave her. Again, here, I don't know if this projects very well. Uh, if you can see the, the skin, how it's um, wrinkled here, that's, that's, def that's the deflation uh, of the skin uh, after bariatric surgery. What, what happens in morbidly obese patients all over their body is the constant stretching of gravity and weight on your skin, you lose the natural rebound elasticity of your skin. If you pull your skin out right now and let it go, it snaps back. If you pull that skin out and hold it there for 15 years and you let it go, it's probably not gonna snap back very well. So what you have to do is you have to remove that skin back to healthier tissue. So what we did is we removed all that skin. Now you can see nice tight envelope around the breasts, we removed uh, all the uh, laxity. We moved her nipple to a higher point on her breast and gave her what she wanted. Again, here's another patient same thing. Here's a, uh, another patient, very uh, younger. She, I think she was 24, actually. Um, she had uh, uh, quadruple D breasts also. And again, her, her main complaint was back pain. She, she did have pretty good um, or pretty bad shoulder grooving as well as inner trigo or the rashes beneath uh, her, her breast, but her main complaint was back pain. Um, and again, um, uh, studies have shown that this procedure will alleviate uh, upper back pain as well as lower back pain. And afterwards, still, we, we gave her her perky, um, the perkiness of her breast. We removed the excess tissue, 
medialized or centralized her nipple onto her chest wall and gave her a natural breast. So mastopexy, this is, or AKA breast lift. Now again, like I mentioned, the normal elasticity of the skin is lost. You lead to a deflated appearance of the breast tissue. Um, and which, you know, a lot of times may not ne necessitate a breast reduction because the, the parenchyma or breast tissue is lost, uh, but you need a breast lift. So this is a lady you'll see a few times because she had a, a few different procedures, uh, but she lost a lot of weight. She came in uh, with grade three ptosis, nipples at the lower uh, portion of her breast, but she had no, her, her, her breasts were completely deflated. So what we did is we marked her out, okay? And there, and there she's at the end of the procedure. She has all of her tissue that was originally down in this area relocated centrally. And when you do that and you remove the inelastic skin around it, you're able to give a nice round breast with adequate projection. So gynecomastia, male, male breast enlargement. This is a case uh, that, that I had. And again, uh, males have breast tissue and they have fat just, just like women, just in different proportions. So increased estrogen increases the fatty component of it. Again, stretches out the skin and leads to uh, hypertrophy of the breasts. Um, this is a younger patient. And this kind of brings up the point that Dr. Halbert was making is that the uh, obesity is a epidemic. It's increasing in our young population. You know, this was, I think, this was a 16 year old kid, you know, that was overly or um, uh, overweight, has been on a diet for several months, lost some weight, but again, the skin is stretched out. He has fat uh, protruding into the undersurface of his nipple. This wouldn't disappear with diet and exercise alone. So again, there's various techniques of doing this. What, what we were able to do is we were able to make a small incision around his nipple, which will, once it heals, you won't even be able to see it. And we removed the excess tissue below uh, the skin there. We were able to smooth out his chest, and this is him at the end of the procedure. Drastic changes immediately. Now moving on to the abdomen and trunk. This brings up the paniculectomy versus abdominal plasty. Uh, and then we'll speak about uh, the individual uh, procedures there. So the difference, pan paniculectomy, this is a common uh, uh, obese patient that comes in for these kind of surgeries. You see within the grooves of the panis, the rashes, um, but the, the difference in between the two techniques, a tummy tuck is the abdominal plastic. It's what you um, probably heard about more on, the, on TV and magazines and things of that nature. Paniculectomy um, removes just the excess skin. A tummy, or a tummy tuck or an abdominoplasty removes even more skin and tightens the abdominal wall. So we, so we give you that more hourglass uh, figure. And this really all depends, you know, unfortunately a lot on insurance, um, but, uh, you know, if, if the patient is very, very sick um, and they're having a lot of issues with their, with their excess skin, then we're more inclined to do the paniculectomy over the larger abdominoplasty, kind of more aesthetic uh, surgery. All right, so how do, you, how do you do these? Pretty much we keep your belly button attached to your abdominal wall. We make a circle around your belly button. We move that to its new location, which we make incisions down in the crease from hip to hip. We try to put it in your natural, um, uh, line of your underwear or your swimsuit. So in those clothing, people won't be able to see that you had surgery. We remove the, all the excess skin and soft tissue, and then we make a small little incision and pull the belly button out at its original spot, okay? And during that, as this slide says, we tighten the abdominal musculature and pull your ab muscles towards the midline, which gives you that flexion force of sitting up from uh, bed, getting out of a chair, thing, things of that nature. Okay, so this is after paniculectomy. Okay, this is simply removing the um, majority of the lower abdominal skin and soft, soft tissue. It doesn't af affect a lot of the, the lateral aspect of it, but what it does is it removed two of her large rolls, gave her 
a, a, f a flat abdomen with minimal scarring that's, that's hidden in her bikini line. Again, another patient um, that came in for a paniculectomy. And you can see how flat her abdomen is compared to before. Now, there's various uh, techniques for uh, a paniculectomy. One is fancy word, fleur de lis, uh, kind of uh, the New Orleans uh, fleur de lis. Um, and this is reserved for patients who have a, not only the vertical excess of abdominal tissue where you pull down and it's flat, but then it's, it's, um, there's a bulging of the sides. What this does, it removes vertically and horizontally. So this is a, uh, this is a great case. This is for this kind of patient, okay? This is the patient who had abdominal surgery, lost some weight, but couldn't. As you can see, this limits her daily activities, okay? She can't go to the gym, she, she can't run. Um, you know, she did what she can, but she does all this excess weight, okay? So how do we do this? And I apologize for the next slide because it has dressings on, but you can see the immediate change on the operating room table. She's flat. Sorry, there's a lot of tape. I, I apologize. But you, you can tell. All that's gone. She's she's, all the excess tissue is removed vertically as well as horizontally. And here's a um, smaller patient. It's kind of hard to see how, how large um, her, her abdomen is just by the pictures. But you can see that as these incisions go out to this area, these on the sides, this is how much skin we're removing vertically. This is how much skin we're moving horizontally and pulling in towards the middle, okay? And this is all kind of determined with a kind of a pinch technique where we see if I give you this, you know, how much would you get? Do you need any of that excess tissue being reduced horizontally? This is actually how much tissue we remove. I tried to limit many of the gory pictures, but, um, and then that is her afterwards. You can see the hourglass figure, which she did not have here. This bulge is now this. So it makes a drastic change. This is where her hip bone is here, right where this ends, and this is her hip bone up here. So she has that hourglass figure. Now this gets into something called a corset body lift. This is something that uh, the guy who sort of invented this, uh, I trained with for two and a half years before, uh, before he left the hospital. And uh, we've went to various um, meetings all over the country and, and presented these findings. This is something, if you think of an eye, that's the incision. But what it does, it removes skin a lot of patients, they complain of uh, excess skin under and lateral to their breast, which they feel is always bothering them, it's always getting caught on um, their clothes, it's irritating them. And this is the patient who needs the vertical as well as horizontal reduction, but in multiple different areas, okay? So these are all patients who came in for the corset body lift. Okay, that's the first patient lost 100 pounds, the second patient 150 pounds and so on up to three, 300 pounds, okay. And this is reserved for those patients who lost, you know, the most massive weight loss patients. These, the, this skin is not gonna return to its normal anatomical location without surgery, okay. So this is a, one, of, one of our patients, and there she is. This is a lower body lift for comparison, okay? So this is a lower body lift, just the bottom, okay? And we also did, a con, uh, in conjunction, a uh, breast lift, as well as an aug augmentation on her. But these are the patients that you can pull in with these procedures. So this is the corset. This is the patient that has excess skin here that will not be um, fixed with just a standard abdominoplasty or paniculectin. It does give that corset appearance. These scars fade. They don't remain red 
Uh, this patient is only a month and a half after her surgery. These scars fade over a year, um, but most of these incisions are hidden. The one under her breast is hidden in her bra or bikini line. The one down here is uh, hidden in, in her uh, bikini line or underwear. Um, the only one that a majority of people can see is the vertical, obviously. Um, but this gives the most drastic change to someone's body. And you can just see, and that's six weeks after surgery. Three weeks. 150 pound weight, weight loss. Again, her hips and thighs could, could be addressed at a later date, but this is what was bothering her most. So we go by the patient's uh, pri priority of what they want. You can just see how like drastic change. going to you guys kind of get the point is all right so this kind of brings us into these uh, realm of surgeries called body lifts okay and something called a belt like pectomy is named after a belt it goes completely around your waist just some patients just by removing abdominal tissue doesn't address what um, excess tissue on their back you know some people have have excess skin that wraps all the way around, okay? And this is what is, is addressed by this belt lipectomy. And in one procedure, we remove all the tissue of your lower abdomen, flanks, as well as back, okay? These lines here, all the tissue between these two lines is, is what's removed. And what it does is it pulls the lateral aspect uh, of your thighs up, it gives you a better uh, waistline. Um, this also serves to give you um, a, potentially a, a, a butt lift. Um, and we could talk, and I'm going to go into some things about that later on. But for people with multiple areas of problems, this is one procedure that can hit multiple areas in one single time. So this is the patient before and after. Okay, this is something called a diver exam. We kind of give an idea how much tissue needs to be removed. And this is the back. It assesses that lateral thigh area that um, wouldn't be um, removed with a standard uh, abdominoplasty or paniculectomy. Okay, and this is something I wanted to talk about. When you remove that skin, you know, plastic surgeons, we don't like to throw any tissue away. There's, there's always a use for something. Um, and this is your own tissue. So what we do is between the, these two lines is what I was uh, showing you earlier would be necessarily removed. But what we, we can do is we can, um, something called deepithelialization, remove some of the skin, but we keep the lower part or the deeper part of the tissue still intact. And we can rotate that down and give you something called an auto um, augmentation, auto bug, uh, butt augmentation using your own uh, tissue rather than you may have heard people put in implants various places you can put butt implants people put breast implants in the butt uh, people uh, not in the US but we actually I've had several cases of people going overseas and getting actual silicone needles injected into their buttocks which is horrible don't ever do that um, but this is something that you're getting a lift as well as a butt enhancement with your own tissue that's there anyway so again, this is actually a male. All this in uh, that's kind of shaded here is rotated down into the lower part of the butt, which gives you a better projection. This is the upper body lift. If you remove all the skin from the bottom of the abdomen and trunk and back, some people still have upper back uh, excess skin right below the bra line, right where your shoulder blade is, which is really hard to address. No matter how hard you pull down and remove that skin, you can't address that area. So this is an upper back lift, which we essentially remove the tissue from the upper back, which is hidden within your bra line. Again, out of plain sight, people can wear bikinis and things like that at the beach without any uh, 
undue worrying uh, about people seeing their scars. This kind of moves on to uh, brachioplasty, which is an arm lift, okay? The, the bat wing, people hold their arms out, see how much tissues below them. A lot of people, they, they complain because they can't wear sleeveless shirts. They're afraid to go out in public with that. It gets caught on their clothes. Um, people come with rashes because they're constantly rubbing. Um, and, you know, we, we offer them various procedures to get rid of that tissue. Um, and before I forget, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, doesn't liposuction um, handle all these things? Uh, no, because it's the inelastic skin. No matter how much fat you suck out, that skin is going to be there. So just, uh, you know, if, if, if someone tells you, oh, yeah, oh, we can just liposuction that out, you're going to left with a deflated uh, area of your body, wherever that, that may be. It's not going to address the cause. Okay, so this is one example of how to do a brachioplasty, uh, where the incision is, and what to expect from skin reduction. Hope this projects. Um, there's various uh, levels of doing a brachioplasty. Some, some people only have uh, excess tissue in certain parts of their arm. Some people have tissue that goes from the armpit all the way down to the elbow. Some people cross the elbow. Some people it includes their lateral or uh, chest wall. So it really depends on the patient. Some people can get away with a little incision in the armpit that's hidden within their hairline and nobody would ever know. Some people with really excess arms, which we'll see in a little bit, need, need a little more. So again, it's expectations. So some before and afters. So this is on the table. Um, this patient was examined preoperatively pre and marked out. Between these two lines is how much excess tissue. And that's about that, that much. Okay, it's a lot. These, these pictures don't do it justice, but you know, that's, that's almost, that's probably about 10, 11 inches worth of tissue that, that's gonna be removed on, on either side, okay? And immediately post-operatively. So this is that example. We have our patients hold their arms out you can feel the lower part of their muscles, their triceps on either side, so you know where the natural arm would end. And everything below that is, is excess. So we, we kind of uh, mark out those areas. Oh, sorry, wrong way. On either side. And once we remove that, she's right away, you know, she's, she's tight. The thing with these pictures is, is I do want to preface, is that uh, I, I try to put as many pictures of, uh, in the operating room as possible to show you the immediate result. A lot of people, um, they you do surgery and say, oh yeah, you'll, you'll see the results you know, months from now. You know, just kind of hold on and wait till things kind of progress. This is something that's immediate. And when these people leave the hospital, they are a whole new person. They are a whole new person. And again, these only get better with, with time. These patients are getting IV fluids for a few hours. Their body becomes edematous with all the extra fluid. Um, just from the surgery, your body swells just from a healing process, inflammatory reaction. So over time, this is gonna shrink up even more. So again, there we go, immediate. So this is that lady we, we saw before. She had her breasts done and her arms done at the same time, and I'll discuss a little later about combining procedures. Okay, afterwards. This is one of the most drastic um, reductions we've, we've done. And as you see here, she has required and extended because she had excess tissue here as well as breast surgery. So we removed all the tissue on the side here that was bothering her and extended that to her breasts. Both arms, it's like a whole new arm. Again, some people have tissue that goes all the way to their elbows and extends into their axilla or their armpit, okay? These won't be uh, alleviated with small incisions, okay? This is three months post-op. It's pretty amazing. This is one of our larger ones. This woman was complaining her, her arms would get caught on almost everything she put on and she could not, she refused to wear anything that wasn't covering her, her arms in public. She was just, she did not want to be seen. 
This is weak post-op, still with some swelling, still drastic change. All right, now getting into the thigh lift, there's something called a medial thigh lift or an extended medial thigh, which is also known as a vertical thigh lift. Again, this really depends on where your excess tissue is, what needs to be removed. Okay, there's the various incisions here. Okay, the horizontal thigh lift or the upper medial thigh lift only re removes a small sliver of tissue highlighted in blue, pulls the thigh up to give you a tight um, uh, inner thigh crease. Now this is an example. This lady, she was complaining a lot. Her main issue uh, was she had uh, psoriatic stretch marks. And on top of her rashes that were in her groin that she couldn't take care of because she was constantly using creams for her psoriasis, um, she also had these stretch marks because she lost about 50 or 60 pounds and wanted something done for her. So we removed about eight to 10 inches of tissue. It's kind of hard to see here without the legs um, in full extension, but um, we removed that and straightened her legs out and removed a good portion of her stretch marks also. So again, this is something called a vertical uh, thigh lift or the large incision on the inner thigh. This is what, what we do. We remove that tissue and, ta and pretty much tailor it to uh, each patient's um, uh, body. This is uh, one of our vertical thigh lift patients. You can see excess tissue bulging here and extends down to the inside of the knee. This is her directly after, immediate. And again, this only gets better with time as things heal and settle and things like that. All right, here's a few other patients immediately post-op. Now combining procedures. Some people say, oh, I want my arms, I want my breasts, I want my abdomen done. What can I do? So I combine breast and arms, abdomen and thighs, breast and thighs, breast and abdomen. Things that if I'm pulling down, I don't want to pull up on something right next to it going the other way. Opposing forces don't work out. Plus, when you combine procedures, there's an increased risk of wound complications. So I pretty much limit two areas on any in individual patient um, at one setting. So here's, uh, just quickly, we saw these two patients. That's her abdomen and thighs. This is our lady from before. Again, breast. This is a, a lady we did arms and abdomen. She had a floor de lis um, and, and, and again, just to review, many health benefits with body contouring, R removal of the excess skin, improvement in your natural body shape. You eliminate the risk of rashes, infections, needs for creams, antibiotics, things of that nature. You can address multiple areas of concern under one anesthesia. You regain your self uh, uh, confidence. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. And again, you sh surgeries are covered by your insurance. Okay, and about 24 hours ago, I was just here, having my little one. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if I was going to make it, but <laughs> I did. And so here's my information. I left little cards out there. If anybody has any questions, concerns, anything, just feel free to email me. He had all the fun. He had all the fun pictures. I think you. I, I want to save time for the awards that you want to hand out. Um, but certainly, we'll hang around for a little bit if you guys have any particular questions about what you saw tonight. Um, thank you guys very much for for coming out. Yeah, thank you. Take just a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have one up front here. I can just ask. No, I'll wait. I'm here. I'm just, I didn't have my. Thank you both for the presentation, first off. Um, question, going back to your stat, where obesity went from 17%, I think yeah. you said, in 04 to 34%. 30, yeah. That, that's mind-boggling. It is. It's just a short time period. Were there any, was there anything like definitional that impacted that, the like, definitions around obesity? I mean, or is it literally the, that, the percent of the population that's obese doubled? Yeah, it, yeah pretty much. Um, it's, uh, it's alarming. It is absolutely, and there, I just read, um, where, which uh, major newspaper posted, but it was um, you know, talking about the alarming rate of increase in our obesity um, population. And um, you know, a lot of this has to do with the ease and accessibility to unhealthy foods. Um, and it also has to do with education. 
Um, you know, if you if you look at different countries, uh, people are are taught at a very young age good food, good nutrition, and I think that uh, schools are so focused on other things now that tends not to be as 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 prominent anymore. Um, you know, you look at a school lunch now. Uh, a lot of times, it's not very healthy. A lot of processed foods. Um, there's juices and there's sugary drinks and sodas and I mean, a lot of my patients drink a soda every day. And it's easy and it's accessible and it tastes good and it starts an addiction to sugar. Um, the, a, a can of soda has two and a half times the daily sugar intake recommendations. Um, and patients will drink a liter of soda sometimes a day. Um, so, it, you know, places like New York, you know, Bloomberg got a lot of uh, kickback because he was taking sodas out and putting a tax on some of these foods. Maybe that's what we need, though. You know, and, and so, and I'm not, you know, playing sides politically, but, you know, maybe we need people to do that kind of thing, you know, and uh, put a tax on some of these things or, or somehow make them not as easily accessible in, in schools in particular. Um, but, yeah, it's just that's, that's what's driving. You look at commercials. <coughs> look, look at a Super Bowl, you know, commercials. It's Doritos and it's, you know, it's beer and it's soda. And that's, that's what we're seeing. We're inundated with it. Yeah. Question over here. Oh, sorry. He's. I think. Go ahead. I just want to get this one in the front here. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Uh huh. So for Doctor Howard, um, why vitamin pills? Like, can you just like eat more veg uh, fruits and vegetables for yeah. vitamins? Or? That'd be great. But the problem is you're not absorbing as much, and you're eating about this much, right, at baseline. And now I'm saying you can only eat this much, and you still gotta get all your nutrients in, especially your protein but you're nutrients too, so you're not taking in as much, you can't physically take in as much anymore. Plus we're also not allowing you to absorb. And the way that we reroute the, the body, especially for a bypass, it's really hard for the body to absorb things like vitamin B12. So supplementation is absolutely important. We wish we could get it all in, in what we, tends not to happen. Okay. And um, for Dr. Golubsi, um after a paniculectomy, paniculectomy, mm -hmm. That's um, pretty good. Can you still get like visible abs, like a six pack? I'm just wondering. Like, I <laughs> yeah. um, these patients, you know, the, the the body contouring patients usually don't come out with a six pack abs. Uh, but the the key is is to remove that tissue that's been causing them one psychological um, uh, illness. I would say uh, one is removing. The, the, the medical issues re regarding rashes and infections and wounds and things like that. The patient, you know, when they come in for these procedures, it's more focused on that than, hey, I want six pack abs kind of, kind of thing. But yeah, no, normally you don't, don't come out with abs at the end. <laughs> All right, question in the back. Um, hi there, I'm a student from the University of Delaware. Um, I have two hypothetical questions. The first one is that um, the first question, you mentioned that there's a huge increase in obesity over the past decade. Will there be an increase in the number of surgeons um, needed to fulfill this population of increase of um, obese people? My second question is that due to the high competition for surgeons in med school, would like the healthcare education system need to reshape itself to offer more resident or um, fellowship positions to meet this population? That's a big question. Yeah, those are really good questions. <laughs> so um, the first one is that uh, if you looked back 15 years ago, there weren't really bariatric fellowships. Um, so I'm specially trained. So what a lot of surgeons that are 15 years out, you know, for, before my time, what would happen is that they would um, do a, a course and they'd learn from other surgeons after they'd been in practice and learn how to do those surgeries and then start doing them. Now we, we do a year fellowship um, where you're inundated every day with the bariatric population, um, learning how to take care of them before and after surgery, so there's a big education component. Um, that was a big push and has increased the number of bariatric surgeons that are out there um, as we're trying to meet that need. Now, I, we are always, as ACGME, and I say we as an ACGME, so the people that dictate how many uh, residency spots and fellowship spots are out there, they're always looking at meet, meeting that need as much as possible. Um, and so it will adapt. What is even more important than the bariatric surgeons is training a bariatrician. And a bariatrician is a medicine doctor that helps treat patients that have obesity. And so it's also not only the surgery component, but it's the preventative 
component and the non-surgical weight loss that is also so important. And we're starting to see an increase of both of those. All right. Unfortunately, we're not going to take any more questions. We are going to get to the little graduation part and do this drawing. <laughs> However, the physicians will be available to speak with you afterwards, as they've indicated, in the lobby because the uh, maintenance people need to get into this room. So thank you Absolutely. very, very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.